Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the public discussion seminar uh, this afternoon. Wonderful to see your smiling faces in person. We've been disrupted by the pandemic so much. Uh, the discussion today is arts, health, and liberation. What can the Black, queer, and trans house ballroom movement teach us about public health intervention? Uh, we're really uh, delighted to have uh, Travis Solway and Michael Roberson with us today. Michael visited us last fall and uh, we had met a couple of years previous, got postponed by the pandemic several times. And uh, in the discussion we did back in the fall uh, with Henry Daniel, Travis, uh, Ralph, uh, who will be leading a workshop uh, tomorrow. We had some great discussions and Michael was in Henry Daniel's dance class yesterday. Uh, today's discussion and tomorrow uh, as well at five o'clock. Um, uh, Michael will be giving us a, a brief history of ballroom followed by uh, Ralph Eskimalian, part of Van Vogue Jam, locally based organization, is going to be doing a workshop on the five basic moves of Vogue. So we welcome you there um, as well. Uh, I just wanted to briefly thank uh, the, the, the partners um, uh, besides uh, SFU's events, the Office of Community Engagement, where I work out of the Cent Center for Gender, Health and Sexual Equity, School for Contemporary Arts, SFU Community Engage Research Initiative, and the Faculty of Health Sciences. Also wanted to uh, recognize that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And uh, just uh, wonderful to uh, see you all in, in, in person uh, here today. Uh, moderating the discussion and, and leading it is Dr. Travis Solway. He's a social epidemiologist whose research investigates population health inequities in the context of stigma. Joined SFU Faculty of Health Sciences in 2019, coming with 18 years of experience working with sexual minority, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer communities to inform and improve public health uh, interventions. Please uh, welcome Travis Solway. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm like bouncing up and down all day because Michael's here and I'm so excited to hear him speak again. Uh, you're really in for a treat. Um, thank you for opening us in a good way and acknowledging these lands um, where I am um, an uninvited guest and settler. Um, I want to just um, make two quick remarks wearing kind of my, my public health hat um, and say a little bit about why I think um, what Michael has to offer us says a lot and, and gives me a lot of humility and hope when it comes to uh, what ballroom has uh, in terms of um, not only um, liberation and um, a response to multiple systems of oppression and a, a beautiful expression of culture and history, but also as a public health intervention. And when uh, Michael was here last fall, he introduced me to this term, which um, was coined by Marlon Bailey, is that right? So Marlon Bailey, um, who uh, wrote his dissertation uh, at Berkeley looking at the ballroom community, and he defined intervention as a public health action. Um, so whereas an intervention you would think of as something that we, we tested it, we found that it works, and now we're going to go and introduce it to this community and, um, and hopefully it will take and hopefully it will um, you know, result in some sort of public health improvement, however defined, uh, but always with this kind of external framework of what is the outcome we want and what is the problem, whereas intravention is really um, about uh, uh, the community itself. It's conducted and sustained through the practices and processes of communities themselves. And I think that offers a really rich and powerful alternative at least to the public health interventions I've seen um, roll out uh, in my experience. Um, the other thing I want to reflect on really as a matter of positionality and the question of kind of whose stories and whose histories um, kind of make it into our consciousness as, um, as queer people, um, particularly from my position as, some, as, a, as a white person who you know, is within a society and a system that um, continually is blind to lots of histories owing to um, white supremacy and, 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 and uh, focus on particular narratives of queer history. And when um, I, I heard, I was just saying, Michael, I heard him in conversation with Jonathan Gibbs. If you haven't heard Jonathan Gibbs' podcast, it's phenomenal. Um, and, and in it, um, you, Michael, you traced the roots of ballroom, you know, it, you know, my kind of, as with Jonathan, you know, my kind of like introduction to the ballroom scene was through Paris is burning and, and, um, 
that's one lens on it, and you're you're going to hear from Michael, um, I think, a, a lot of complexity and critique around that. But you know, rather than and so in in my mind, you know, I connect that history that I see in Poe's and in Paris is Burning to 1980s New York, just after gay liberation uh, in the context of the AIDS epidemic. And what you said is, no, no, we can trace the roots of ballroom to the great migration, to the Harlem Renaissance. Um, that ballroom really has a particular meaning in the context of black history, which is something that I hear from indigenous people a lot too, when we try to co-opt these ideas, things like two spirit, and realize, no, no, this only makes sense in the history of indigenous people. Likewise, I think what we're gonna hear is, is really something powerful about those intersections of, um, of, of race and gender and sexuality. So uh, I won't say any more because I'm just so excited to hear from Michael. Um, I Just two kind of housekeeping pieces. One is Michael, if I understand, you can reiterate this, uh, welcomes questions throughout the session, so don't hold back. Um, and when you have a question, if you could just raise your hand, um, because um, we are recording this, and uh, it's nice for us to have your question on the microphone so that people who are watching later can hear what was asked. So Alia and Steve, um, who are in the back, will, will uh, very graciously come around with a microphone when you have your hand up. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it, oh, well, uh, I wanna read Michael's bio because it's a fantastic bio. I, I have to. Okay, this is a few sentences, it's fun. Okay, Michael, Michael Robertson is a public health practitioner, advocate, activist, artist, curator, and leader within the LGBTQ community, as well as an adjunct professor at the New School University, Lang College, NYC, and Union Theological Seminary, NYC. He's an international art and politics consultant and member of the International Sound Art Collective entitled Ultra Red. Okay, one last thing, which is, Although Michael has not himself watched this TED Talk, I highly recommend <laughs> Michael's TED Talk where he talks about the underground Black Lat Latino LGBT house ballroom community. Um, this was entitled, Ballroom Has Something to Say to Teach the World over, uh, About Being Human, the Struggle for Freedom in the Face of Catastrophe. So with that, please join me in welcoming Michael Robertson. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, am I, so is this on or is this on? Which one? Both of them? No, it's not. No, no, there you go. So good evening. No, no, no. I was in, in Professor Henry Daniels class yesterday and I said to them when they did the same thing that you did, that if you knew me and knew me well, you would know that I'm a big fan of choirs. And when I say good evening, we'll say good evening in unison. Good evening. Good evening. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. It's so very interesting to see these bios and pictures and the way we pose. <laughs> I was like, who was that child up there with that Brooklyn We Go hard hat on? Right? Right. But I want to I'm going to begin this, my hyper-fantastic imagination. Oprah Winfrey is my mother, and Dr. Cornel West is my father. So you're going to get both of them, at least my, my, my attempt to do both of them. And I want to begin, I say that for a particular reason, I want to begin with just a short blurb from Dr. West when he wrote his book, The Black Prophetic Fire, looking at six particular figures. And he asked the question, formulated a question. And this was in the midst, at the beginning of Black Lives Matters and Trayvon Martin, he asked, are we witnessing the death of black prophetic fire in our time? Are we experiencing the demise of the black prophetic tradition in present day America? Do the great prophetic figures and social movements no longer resonate in the depth of our souls? Have we forgotten how beautiful it is to be on fire for justice? This is where we're going to have this discussion tonight. And I'm going to attempt to lodge this conversation, not only from this place, but through these three queries. One is a philosophical query. What does it mean to be human? in the struggle for freedom when you're faced with catastrophe over and over 
and over again. The great Greek philosopher Montaigne said philosophy is about learning how to die. The second one is a theological one. What does it mean to be fully human and fully divine? Particularly when you've been told that the essence of your being is not situated in the image of God. And the third one's a political one. Ella Baker, great civil rights labor movement, she said, who are your people? That if the organizing we do is not connected to a people that is moved. And how do we begin, particularly as marginalized people, move away from organizing around the right not to die and move towards the right to live? Those are two separate things, be real clear. So we're going to do that today. It's going to be interesting. I'm going to do my little intro of myself for a particular reason and begin to utilize a protocol that I'll tell you about in a few. But my name is Michael Robinson, of course. I'm originally from Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey is a small inner city across the bridge from Philadelphia. My trajectory about Camden is that it's hood, hood. I can say that you can't, because I'm from there. <laughs> that Camden and Detroit in the US and Baltimore are very similar cities, small cities with big city problems. I went to school there, graduated from college there, applied to Rutgers University Law School twice, got accepted twice and put on a waiting list, and I got tired of waiting. Then I began working for the Camden City Board of Education as a crisis counselor, which introduced me into the world of public health. And at the same time, I began to do psychiatric emergency services in two hospitals per diem. And then I began facilitating a youth discussion support group for LGBT young folk of color in Philadelphia at an indigenous black aid organization called Colors. And then I began to go to graduate school attempting, you, you heard the word attempting, to try to get a master's in education and curriculum and instruction, and that got disrupted, got disrupted. I, one of the beautiful things about working for the Board of Education, particularly in the Northeast of the US, is that when it snows bad, you don't have to go to work. And so there was a point when the weatherman will forecast snow and I will wake up in the morning and there was no snow, I started getting mad at God. I said, something's gotta change. It's a true story. I was sitting home listening to Maxwell. Maxwell is one of my favorite neo-soul singers. And I heard this voice. And this voice said to me very softly, you need to move to New York City and do the work you want to do with LGBT young folk. And I got your back. Two months later, July, I put in my resignation with the Board of Education. Two months later, September 1999, I moved to New York City with $177 worth of change. And I've been there ever since. I've been blessed enough to be able to do some, to expand the work in public health. As you were talking, Travis, um, particularly targeting black and Latinx LGBT folk around HIV prevention. Done some things for my former boss and created some things and all this other stuff. You can see it on the bio. But then I got fired in a public way. Very painful. And as I said earlier, the philosophy was about learning how to die. I went to seminary. Theology was about a rebirth. I did not go to seminary to be a, a pastor or a minister. Don't get confused with my, my performativity. Not at all. But I did want to place in conversation, as we were going to talk today, that this theological abomination narrative had a direct impact on health disparities impacted black gay men. That, the, that you tell a folk that the very essence of who they are is antithetical to God. Their body is a problem. I talk about Du Bois, what does it mean to be a problem? And then you ask them to engage in protective factors over a body they've been told is no good to God, it made no sense. I had witnessed, particularly young black and Latinx gay men coming into the office, uh, getting an HIV test and coming out negative and going, Shh, not because Shh, I'm negative, because it hasn't happened yet. Because of belief, they begin to internalize that they're that, that they were predisposed to become HIV positive, not because they were engaged in any riskier sex than their counterparts. Research says that. But the intersection of being black and gay means HIV. And I wanted to help change that narrative. So I went to seminary, got some degrees from, from Union Theological Seminary. For the past 10 years, along with public health, I've been doing race, sexuality, and theological work through the Center for Race and Religion and Economic Democracy. As Professor, uh, as, prefer, as Professor T, I'll call him, as Professor Travis said, that I also am a member of an international art, sound art collective called Ultra Red. And we're going to use Ultra Red's protocols 
in this discussion today. And ultra red emerges out of the ACT UP movement. And our ability, our, our desire was to use, the desire was to use sound as an investigative tool. And that's what we're going to do today. The listening is the first condition to organizing. That's a political statement. I'll be theological a little way. The listening is the condition, cosmologically, to hear the universe's voice, to hear your own voice, to hear the voice of the ancestral cry for freedom. That's what we're going to do today. That okay with y'all? Mm. So I, I, yesterday I was in Professor Daniel's class. I asked the question, when the, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word ballroom? And when people begin to speak, I understood that they were not talking about the people I was about to talk about. So it's always my intent to use videos to demonstrate the house ball ballroom community. And one of the things we'll do is we'll bring the ancestors in the room. It's a, sort of the black tradition. Because this community, as we'll talk throughout this night, are on intimate terms with death. Over and over and over again, oftentimes, there's not an outcry for larger, from larger communities. So I'm going to play three videos back to back to back. I played them for Professor Daniel's class yesterday. And I'm going to ask you to think about just three propositions, real simple propositions. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? And we're going to do two iterations of these listening sessions, especially when I began to engage in this analysis around HIV surveillance between 1981 and 2021. We'll do that as well. So again, I'm going to ask you three things. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? Let me ask another question. Anybody who watches RuPaul Drag's Race? Yeah, I saw them hands. They said, like, yes. As I said yesterday, one of the things I will always do is lift RuPaul up for what he's been able to do. I remember it must have been 1993, was sitting home watching black entertainment television, and I saw RuPaul's video, Supermodel. I said, this is a different day. Right. So what he's been able to do, particularly to place this cultural production in the landscape of the larger imagination. I offer a critique as well. And the critique is that the drag race, though wonderful, is lodged between a white queer lens. That when I was younger, that these performances were almost always done by trans women. We just called them drag performances because we didn't have language called trans gender to call them. And they were usually always on a Sunday. That's not accidental. This is the day that we were systematically pushed out of church. So the club became our church. And the performer became, I used to go to a Baptist church, became like the black woman I went to see sing every Sunday with the voice. I call it a hermeneutics of the body. How one reads text, contextualized pain and joy and desire. But there's a critique to be made there as well, because what we tended to do was to use trans women as spectacles, like we do women. Perform for us, for our elation, but that when the lights go down, we were not interested in full humanity. We're going to see a trans woman named Princess Jeannette who performs a lip sings, a, who lip sings a song called Rhythm of Love. It's at the beginning of a play that we did, and what's remarkable is that we had no idea that her body was riddled with pain, that she was, she was experiencing through cancer. She performs for us anyway. She winds up passing away. And every time I get a chance to show this performance, bring her in the room, is to demonstrate that we all oftentimes sit in our privilege. Me, as a doubly marginalized black and gay man, sit in a patriarchal privilege that allows me to still be here, her not here. So let's do this. Now, let me put this out. Now, I am the most technologically ignorant person there is. And so, we're going to, did I do that? Wow. <laughs> 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 oh, wow. I did that. So we're going to watch, first we're going to watch a PSA. 
It is a PSA about black trans lives, how lives matter. It is a spliced up video of a performance we did called Heavenly Bodies, just a position, just posing the Bet Gala's Heavenly Bodies. Then you'll watch a video of, that memorializes house ball ballroom community, people who are no longer here, and then you'll watch the performance, and then I'm going to open it up. Well, let's do this. There'll be peace in the valley for me someday. There'll be peace in the valley, Lord, for me. Oh, yes. There'll be no sorrows, no sadness, Lord.
this last one is Princess Jeanne and her lipstick performance of Rhythm of Love. You know, sometimes it just spins too fast and you cannot only lose your balance but you lose your rhythm and it's at times like these that you just need to stop and not only find your way again but find your own rhythm because life has a rhythm and, and Mother Nature has a rhythm and love Oh, yes, love has a rhythm.
what you did not know was that Travis required for each and every one of you to do the same thing before you leave this way. <laughs> we'll talk about why holding space, particularly like that, was important, especially when we look at the surveillance of HIV AIDS and its impact on this community. But I want to open it up. Uh, who's where my, my, my mic folk? Just to throw it out there, to engage in this conversation, three simple propositions, please don't be shy. Real easy, no judgment. What did you hear from watching those videos? What did you see from watching those videos? What did you feel? What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? To get my intent was to bring the ancestors in the room. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? Who back here? So what I heard was, I'm actually going to start with what I felt was like empowerment. Yeah. Um, what I saw was pain. And then what I heard was a call for help. Thank you. Thank you. Empowerment, pain, and a call for help. Thank you. Did you have your hand up, or you was re you was selling him that he had his hand up? Oh, well, since you put your hand up, Weston wants to say something too. <laughs> um. Well, first of all, for someone who's supposedly technology inept, you did well. Thank you. you did great. <laughs> um, I was seeing these, and I was thinking. Why did you choose them? Oh, like, they're so different yeah. at first glance. I was like, one is so full of energy mm -hmm. and just like, just so dynamic and taking up space. And the other one just made me feel so sad. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to cry. <laughs> and then I realized that's exactly Eesh. what it was in that moment. And like, maybe still is now, like just, especially at the peak of the AIDS, uh, pandemic, epidemic, and just like people dying all around you and just reclaiming mm. this voice mm. and this space mm. and just the absolute effort that mm. goes into just spreading joy mm. when you're surrounded by such sadness is just like this incredibly powerful and brave and almost unbelievable thing to do. That's what I was thinking. It was beautiful yeah. what you were thinking. <laughs> Let me keep the mic for a minute because one of the things that you said that I think is absolutely so important is we're going to talk about today this notion of the peak. Who are we? Who's the peak we talking about? So we're going to problem a time. We're going to put it in tension. So I like the fact of what you just said. So thank you for that. Thank you. Who else? A couple more. What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? There you go. My great, my great colleague Robert Simber says we go, we we need to go beyond the safe space and go to the brave space. So go ahead, brave for me. <laughs> um, I think it depends on which video we're talking about. You can um, say all of them if you want. In terms of what I heard, okay, you know, what I saw in all of them was resistance yeah. and resilience, mm. um, and a bit of grief. Um, what I heard, depending on which one we're talking about, is very similar. You know, there, there were pieces of grief there. I would say in the last one, though, I, I, I heard a lot of reverence. Yeah. yeah. Um, in spite and joy, of the pain. And this joy. Yeah. Um, and the type of resistance that can come from joy and community. Um, and what was the last thing? What did you feel? Um... Gratitude. Like as a trans woman growing up today, like the only reason why I'm I'm here still is because of all of that. Yeah. I, I would I would argue that the only reason I'm here is because you your people were forced. 
be real clear that one of the things we'll push oh, back the on the Oh, the gratitude is for the trans that's women. Right, that's right. That's right. Because be real clear. That's right. There you go. The rest of y'all got yeah. none of that. <laughs> there you go. Because we, 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 we have to place that intention to whom we give credit to, whose histories we lift up. And I'm always saying, even if we'll talk about the, 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 the emerging the houseball community, but I'm oftentimes talking about the audacity oftentimes of gay mm. men to not push back on our patriarchy and not realize that if not for trans folk, we could not have an LGBT movement. Let's be real clear. Let's atone for that lie. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for sharing your experience and allowing us to reflect. I was wondering in terms of, uh, about uh, the element of freedom mm -hmm. that uh, all, the, all the characters could express. Because even when people are dying, there's an element of visibility. Can I go die invisibly or whether I can mm -hmm. die visible? So in spite of all the pain and suffering, they were ready to continue performing mm -hmm. and showing their freedom. Mm -hmm. So I, and I was looking at the audience of, there were some elements where the audience was, and I was wondering what, what made me there, come there mm -hmm. and see the people. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, and the last one I think was Solo, which uh, there was a time when she holds the bar and, and I was wondering that bar was for her support mm -hmm. because a lot of people I've seen in my life who died of HIV or AIDS, they've always had the element of strength and weakness. Yeah. And there was bouncing between the two. Yeah. So you uh, do you get my point? I do get your point. And so a couple of things, what I may have not done well with. Sorry? What I may have not done well with is to, to say that the last video yeah. was her performing on a balcony to an audience. And so there's this call and response we'll talk about that oftentimes engaged through black church, this call and response. But there is to your wonderful point around uh, that I never noticed, I think a student at Mr. Da uh, Professor Daniel's class said the same thing about holding the bar. I never noticed that before and wondering, I'm gonna wonder around uh, the holding herself up because she was riddled with pain, right? And yes. still showed up, still showed up for the elation of the entire community, right? And oftentimes that is the, the experience of many trans women in our community. So we're gonna talk about that, we're gonna investigate that. Thank you very much. So I wanna throw out a sentiment Zero Near Hursting once said, African-American Harlem Renaissance writer. She said that black women are the mules of the earth. Always trampled on over and over and over again. I oftentimes say that black women, particularly in our community, are situated as Christ. Self-sacrificing. Nailed to the cross. Always having to give of herself to the whole family, whole community, even to her precious children historically. Nothing left for her. But if black cis women are the mules of the earth, then black trans women are lodged somewhere between Franz Fanon's notion of the wretched of the earth and Howard Thurman's notion of the disinherited. And still, somehow, they made a way, and this way is called ballroom. So I'm getting ready to date myself. I am a fan, I've always been a fan of the Golden Girls. So I'm going to read be Sophia, right? I'm going to do picture this. True story. Picture this. If not for slavery in the U.S., if not for the Emancipation Proclamation, if not for the creation of black reconstruction and its dismantle, if not for the rise of Jim and Jane Crow racism and lynching, if not for the great migration of black folk from the southern part of the U.S. moving to the northern part and Harlem becomes a new black Mecca. If not between 1919 and 1931, the creation of a black radical political artistic movement called the Harlem Renaissance. If not for the black church, I'll name it specifically, Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. Created a three-decade campaign to get rid of black queers. 
responding to a Dutch moral report form that said that Harlem was the most vice-written community in New York City. And because these black queers were making us, making Harlem unrespectable, there was a campaign to get rid of them. They used the Amsterdam newspaper because they owned it. Sermonized against it. Used the church to do that. But there are three ways that these black queers congregated. At beauty salons, rent parties, which is nothing but to have a party to pay your rent, and drag balls. And drag balls become the largest, I call it political, I also call it theological movement of a folk who were homeless in the new space that was supposed to be their home. What does it mean for people to leave a space looking for a space of freedom and to be unfree in this free space? So my first tenet of ballroom is that it's a black trans womanist theological discourse because it creates itself in contestation to the black church around the theology that we matter to. But after World War II, where other cities became blacker in the U.S. context, Detroit, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C., I said that, right? Chicago, well. These drag balls migrate as well. In fact, there were black publications who would uh, publish some of the pictures from these drag balls. And right afterwards, Jet Magazine would do it. There would be a sermon the next month over and against this community. But in 1967, a black trans woman in Crystal La Beja. She resists racism in a drag ball circuit, pageant circuit. There's a wonderful documentary on YouTube, you can watch also clips of it, called um, The Queen, or the legendary Crystal La Beja. And she, res she resists racism and colorism um, in the circuit. She, wa she walks off stage as a political movement. And there was a guy named Phil Black who whispered, the whisper is my reimagination, so I wasn't there and said to Crystal, let's go back to the old Harlem drag ball circuit. And in 1968, the very first house was created. And why this is important, because drag ball just meant that trans women performed. We called them drag balls again because the language, the access to transgender was not there. So we called trans women drag queens. But in 67, when she resists, and in 68, she creates the very first house named after her, the House of La Beja. So no longer was it an individual movement, but it was a political constructive movement called houses or families. We call them kinship structures. And there were five, I call them freedom fighters, who emerged at this time. They become the mothers of the modern house ball community. Avis Pendarvis. Duchess Lawang, Paris Dupree, Peppa La Beja, and Dorian Corey. And Dorian Corey is interesting. We saw her a little bit in the Barbara Memorial video. Dorian Corey is interesting. I'm going to skip ahead for, for a reason. She died due to complication of HIV and AIDS in 1993. And uh, she was part of the Pearl Box Review. She, again, she was one of the mothers of the modern LGBT ballroom community. And when she died, they found a mummified body in her closet. And the story goes that a John tried to rob her and kill her, and she killed him instead. And we know, if we look at the laws today, can imagine what have happened, that idea of, of, of saying that it was self-defense would have not been the case. And somehow she had to wherewithal to mummify this body. And so they found the body in 1993 when she passed away, and we're, going, we're doing actually a documentary on her life and her story. But again, through these, these five freedom fighters, we began this sort of kinship structure and we create these houses that become political movements, theological movements, mother, father, children, because people were being disenfranchised, people were being pushed out of their families because of their sexuality, this intersection between white supremacy and homophobia in black community. And then 1981 happened. I jumped ahead for a reason. And as I said, so we are, I, I have been accused of, critique is just a better word, of not giving trigger alerts. So I'm giving one now. Because we're going to watch a series of videos that sort of historicize LGBT organizing, two prior to the HIV crisis 
and for as a result of. Some of it can be triggering. But I'm a believer it is absolutely a blessing to be triggered because if you're not triggered, you have succumbed to the notion that pain, particular kinds of pain, that oppression of people is the norm. It's a challenging conversation, but this moment requires it. It's a trigger alert. You'll watch about five videos. This is what we call listening session, Ultra Red. And then I'll open it up again, what you hear. See, Phil and I do the historical analysis of HIV and its surveillance, particularly around the houseball community, as, as Professor Travis said, and the interventions that we created as a result. Is that okay? And I would tell you, I'm not going to tell you who these folks are yet. This will be part of my, what did you hear, see, feel. Okay. And I would tell you my methodology and why I place these videos in dialogue. to die. I want no Negro to die. I want no human being to die or to be brutalized because I thoroughly believe that this struggle can be won without brutalization. We will not tolerate the beating homes of black people any longer. We will stay in these damn streets until every Negro in the country can vote. We call for a non-violent uprising with people sitting, standing, being arrested, white and black together. Fired like to cause trouble. He caused trouble in very banal and everyday ways. He caused trouble in world historical ways. We have been told that we will be arrested if we stay here. Byard's life was over some 60 years of activism. And almost every major event between the 40s through the 70s, Byard played a role. Sit down, I can't sit down. Now won't you sit down? Sit down, I can't sit down. Just go to heaven when I move around. I don't think without Clyde Rustin, the modern civil rights movement would have won half of the victories that it won. Amen. That segregation be ended in every school district in the year 19. It is hard for me to think of a man who was more talented, a public intellectual, an organizer unequaled in his time. Why did he remain in the background? Why was he an advisor to this, that, or the other great person? but never himself coming forward in the full measure of his great talent. We need in every community a group of angelic troublemakers. <laughs> Our power is in our ability to make things unworkable. The only weapon we have is our bodies. And we need to tuck them in places so wheels don't turn.
Just a moment. Just a moment. I would like to avoid any trouble. This is a day of unity for us. I want us to be happy. Let's All right, it's up to the gay people. What do you want to do? Listen, we don't know what you want. Now, do you want these people to speak? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, please wait, please wait. Will the people who want it say yes? That's the end of the conversation. Give me a 
No, you're gonna have a chance to talk, all right? Everybody's gonna Don't have a chance lecture to me, talk. you stupid, lazy, incompetent shithead. Bill, everybody drop the flyer. There's gonna be a question and answer period. You can't just lick his ass before he talks. Shut and the fuck up and let him answer. answer. Look, there are a lot of people in the audience who want to ask and talk about treatment, and I think it's important that we allow that to happen. Oh, now, we're gonna dictate free speech now? You're the one who's interfering with speech right now. Go I don't the GMAC or whatever a pimp operation is paying you. You're making the same point, George Bush. Plague! We are in the middle of a fucking plague! And you behave like this! Plague! 40 million infected people is a fucking plague! We are in the worst shape we have ever, ever, ever been in. All those pills we're shoveling down our throat, forget it. ACT UP has been taken over by a lunatic fringe. They can't get together. Nobody agrees with anything. All we can do is field a couple of hundred people at a demonstration. That's not going to make anybody pay attention. Not until we get millions out there. We can't do that. All we do is pick at each other and yell at each other. And I say to you in year 10, the same thing I said to you in 1981 when there were 41 cases. Until we get our acts together, all of us, we are as good as dead. No damage is done. And if and the hassles that are attended, that puts you in a com Say the right thing so that if one. My friends, David Evans, Nicholas Kaiser, George Marshall, and my beloved brother, Dennis. Jay. Robert R. Hackett, Philip Gregory Ellison, Terry Ronan, Michael Bennett, Donald Red, Ralph Field, Tina Chow, Perry Ellis, Freddie Mercury, Peter Allen, to the thousands of other people who were made to suffer in silence. itself does good stuff and is moving still it's like making something beautiful out of the epidemic and I felt like doing something like this is a way of showing there's nothing beautiful about it you know this is what I'm left with I've got a, a box full of ashes and bone chips you know there's no beauty in that and I, I felt like a statement like this is like saying this is what George Bush has done you know this is a him and Ronald Reagan before him have done these are our loved ones, and this is what they've been reduced to, and we're bringing them to the person who's responsible for their death.
Welcome to the first of three debates among the major candidates for President of the United States, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Mr. President, yesterday, tens of thousands of people paraded past the White House to demonstrate their concern about the disease AIDS. A celebrated member of your commission, Magic Johnson, uh, quit saying that uh, there was too much inaction. Where is this widespread feeling coming from that your administration is not doing enough about AIDS? I can't tell you where it's coming from, but I am very much concerned about AIDS. And I believe that we've got the best researchers in the world out there at NIH working the problem. It's one of the few diseases where behavior matters. And I once called on somebody, well, change your behavior. If the behavior you're using uh, prone to cause AIDS, change the behavior. The next thing I know, one of these ACT UP groups is out saying Bush ought to change his behavior. You can't talk about it rationally. Let everyone here know that this is not a political funeral for Mark Fisher, who wouldn't let us burn or bury his courage or his love for us any more than he would let the earth take his body until it was already in flight. He asked for this ceremony, not so we could bury him, but so we could celebrate his undying anger. This isn't a political funeral for Mark. It's a political funeral for the man who killed him and so many others and is slowly killing me, whose name curls my tongue and curdles my breath. George Bush, we believe you'll be defeated tomorrow because we believe there's still some justice left in the universe and some compassion left in the American people. But whether or not you are here and now standing by Mark's body, we put this curse on you. Mark's spirit will haunt you until the end of your days so that in the moment of your defeat, you'll remember our defeats. And in the moment of your death, you'll remember our deaths. As for Mark, when the living can no longer speak, the dead may speak for them. Mark's voice is here with us, as is the voice of Pericles, who two millennia ago mourned the Athenian soldiers who didn't have to die, and in whose death he was complicit, but who had the nobility to say that their memorial was the whole earth. Let the whole earth hear us now. We beg, we pray, we demand 
that this epidemic end. Not just so we may live, but so that Mark's soul may rest in peace at last. And in anger and in grief, this fight is not over till all of us are safe. Act up, fight back, fight AIDS. This one I will contextualize because you're going to see here a poem. I want you to pay attention to the poem as it's the sort of sound. Brother to brother, 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 brother to brother. Brother to brother, brother to brother, brother to brother, brother to brother. Mother, do you know I roam alone at night? Wearing colognes, tight pants, chains of gold. Searching for men willing to come back to candlelight. I'm not scared of these men. Though some are killers of sons like me. I learned there is no tender mercy for men of color, for sons who love men like me. Do not feel shame for how I live. I chose this tribe of warriors and outlaws. Do not feel you failed some test of motherhood. My life has borne fruit. No woman could have given me anyway. If one of these thick lipped, wet, black nights, while I'm out walking, I find freedom in this village. If I can take it with my tribe, I'll bring you here. And you will never notice the absence of rice and bridesmaids. Whatever awaits me, this much I know. I was blind to my brother's beauty, and now I see my own. Deaf to the voice that believed we were worth wanting, loving each other. Now I hear. I was mute, tongue-tied, burdened by shadows and silence. Now I speak, and my burden is lightened, lifted. Free. And this is an assertion. When I think about how I came to write my book, Sexuality in the Black Church, it was really a pretty personal journey for me. And if anyone told me that that's what I was going to be writing on, I would have told them they were crazy. I've dedicated the book to my best friend, whom I called my cousin, and was the godfather of my son, Lloyd. And in many respects, it was Lloyd who made me write the book. By the time I wrote the book, Lloyd had passed uh, to complications from AIDS. Lloyd happened to be one of the best human beings I would ever have the privilege of knowing. He loved the church, but his church didn't love him back. So somehow, I knew that if I was going to stay in this church, I had to figure it out. Because I was really in, when I wrote that book, was really writing out of this kind of existential dilemma and pain. How can I love a church that was treating someone like Lloyd so badly? 
And so I knew if I was gonna stay in this black church, I had to figure it out. And that's what I did. And so I sort of, when they say theology is faith, seeking understanding, that's what writing that book was for me. Let's sit with that for a bit. As I know that it was a lot, the intent was for it to be a lot. Because this a lotness, I made up that word, is the thing that communities are feeling every day of their lives. And oftentimes don't have the space for refuge. It's part of the reason why ballroom is so important. It's part of the reason why I showed the video of Princess Jeanne performing, why those lip sync performances were so important. It's part of the reason why gay clubs, at one point, were so important. So to open it back up, and I'm going to do this historical analysis, I'd give you, I'll give you sort of the method to my madness and why I place them in conversation and contextualize them as I do this. But anything that you heard and saw felt that you want to bring into this space? I've been living. Am I? Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I've been living with HIV for 15 years, um, and it's okay. I've had to bury a lot of my family, my chosen family. And I don't have very many people left. And my own family disowned me, <clears throat> made me the black sheep of my own family. Um, uh, I thought the one video that you had where uh, they were naming the names. Yeah. It reminded me back when we used to do that here at the AIDS Wall Memorial, yeah. uh, where we just came together and the community would actually just come and it was so empowering that um, I just found everything to be very empowering and very concrete yeah. <clears throat> that where I'm at in my life is where I'm supposed to be. Jeez. And, and uh, I do drag for a living, so I'm also um, I'm a gender fluid individual, so um, I just wanted to say thank you. <clears throat> yeah. I want to... Uh First, honor you and thank you for being vulnerable enough to be in this space and to share that. So thank you so very much. Because you're absolutely true, right? Absolutely true. The amount of people who are no longer here, the intimate terms that communities are dealing with death under the larger eyes of the whole world. I'm still no outcry. I'm going to lift up the wonderful thing. So we talk a little bit about this when you use the word the peak the HIV crisis. So thank you for invoicing that in the room. Anybody else? What did you hear? What did you see? What did you feel? I'll start with, what I'll say is I'll start with that first video, Baird Rustin. Anyone know who's Baird Rustin in the room? Yeah, always in the back. Wasn't an interesting story. So Baird Rustin, openly black, gay, civil rights, labor movement, anti-nuclear movement. In fact, in 1947, he was part of, in fact, let me back up, he was a pacifist, a member of the largest pacifist organization, the Fellowship of Reconciliation of the U.S. And in 1947, he was arrested because he, with some black folk and some white folk in the U.S., New York City, got on a bus, drove down I-95 to protest against segregation laws, got arrested. And his punishment was 22 days on a chain gang. And we know the chain gangs is when prisoners are chained by the ankles and by the wrists 
and forced to work in horrendous hours and conditions. And when he was released, he wrote about it in the New York Post published, and they got rid of that punishment in North Carolina. This is seven years prior to Rosa Parks. He was an advisor also to Dr. Martin Luther King. And in 1960, Martin Luther King was going to march in front of the Democratic National Convention. And Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was the most famous black politician of his time, was very envious of Martin Luther King's rise. In fact, it was his father that I mentioned earlier who created a three-decade campaign to get rid of black queers. This is going to make a connection for you. And so Adam is sent by the white Democrats to talk to Martin Luther King and say, you cannot march in front of the Democratic National Convention. Now, I'm going to reimagine the conversation and really go like this. Martin Luther King said, oh, yes, it did. And so Martin Luther King said, yes, we are. He said, no, you can't. Yes, you are. And he did say this, that if you do, I'm going to put out a rumor that you and Bear Russell are lovers. That's not a, I didn't make that story up. It's absolutely true. And because of the fear of homophobia and what it would do for the movement, he allowed Bear Russell to resign. Until 1963, they brought Bear Rustin back, and Bear Rustin is the organizer of the 1963 March on Washington, not Martin Luther King. He was the speaker. This openly black gay man. Oftentimes, I'm I talk to, to young LGBT black folk particularly, and black folk who, are, who identify as cis and hetero around homophobia in the black community and say I'm confused by it, particularly when you talk about freedom movement. Because the most emblematic event around the black struggle for freedom in the U.S. context, post-slavery is in 1963 March on Washington, organized by an openly black gay man. The most emblematic event around the black struggle for freedom in the U.S. context, post the March on Washington, is this moment now, Black Lives Matter. Two were the founders of black lesbians. Now, how are you homophobic? How are you demonizing? the very people that your freedom is coming from. I call it plantation psychosis. So that is Bear Rustin. The next video was Sylvia Rivera. Who knows Sylvia Rivera? Yeah, Sylvia's too important, not the Bear was not. Right. 1969, we know that June 27th, 1969, Mark, this event that we call the Stonewall Rebellion, and in New York City, it was illegal for men to dance with men and women to dance with women. And particularly, they were used to raid, they would raid uh, gay clubs and use it. They didn't have cabaret licenses in order to do so. And on this day, as the story is told, that the cops come, came to raid the club and Sylvia locked the doors of the club. Puerto Rican trans woman. And Marsha P. Johnson, black trans woman, threw an item at the castle. For four days, there was a rebellion. And most of the people there were black and brown trans folk and poor white street kids. The world over knows nothing about this rebellion until 1970 because 1970 marks the very first gay pride in New York City as a celebration of it. So all gay prides, for the most part, internationally, are built on these women's back. So this was 1973, four years later. And she's in Washington Square Park, and she once is, is, is in the midst of the gay liberation parade, and she wants to get on stage, and they won't allow her. And the folk who won't allow her called themselves, they didn't call themselves, they were white, radical lesbians who believed that trans women had no right in the feminist movement because they brought male energy. They were the ones who were booing. And Sylvia almost gives an omen to marriage equality to some degree. That we cannot forget those who are losing their lives, who are locked up, and you're becoming like a white middle class club. She has oftentimes been invisibilized when we talk about the lexicon of histories of LGBT movements. The very next video was Larry Kramer. Larry Kramer was a writer. He was conservative at first in the 1970s. In fact, Larry Kramer believed that all of the sex that was happening in the 70s because of, because of the freedom movement that 
this, there was a, 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 a disadvantageous effect to that. And then AIDS happened and he said, aha, see? Until he realized that the government wasn't doing anything. This is very important because in 1980, I should have put it up there first, Ronald Reagan becomes our president. Ronald Reagan, neoliberal, cutting social programs, right? Created this false war on drugs. Whispered not nothing, not anything about HIV and AIDS, but one time during his presidency. We talk about, we in America talk about Trump not having a national plan for a year. Ronald Reagan had none for seven years. He allowed gay men to, die, to get infected and die. That's not hyperbole. I'm not making it up. I'm probably underestimating it. Allow men to get infected and die for seven years. Right? So we know in 1981 was the surveillance of 41 cases. We called them gay cancer. We really called it GRID. Gay-related immunodisease. I oftentimes ask the question, what does it mean for a community to be named, for a terminal disease to be named after a community? What does it do to the psyche and the spirit of a people? It would be as if, because it's high prevalence of diabetes in black communities, if diabetes is called black diabetes. What it would do to the spirit of people? What it did for, to the spirit of the people? In 1982, right, we made a distinction 1982, we made a distinction. So you can acquire it now. This is a disease that could be acquired, AIDS. And 1984 made a distinction between the virus and the disease. 1984 is important because in the US context, crack is an epidemic, begins to impact, particularly black and brown communities. And as Reagan was cutting social programs, black community particularly began to organize around that. And black folk made an intentional decision to say that if black, that we would deal with crack and not HIV because if black gay men were becoming HIV positive, it was the thing that we deserved. It was God's way of getting rid of perversion from the earth and it was our punishment. I'll jump back to 1986. 1987. ACT UP is created by Larry Kramer again. Larry Kramer creates GMAC, Game and Health Prices, and becomes the very first not-for-profit uh, not, not response to the epidemic. And he began to realize that GMAC was too conservative in his approach, and he wanted to be more radical, so he creates ACT UP as a political movement. What we saw... in that third or fourth video was what we call the Names Project. The Names Project was to concretize the names of folks who were, no, to your wonderful point, who were dying for HIV and AIDS, and still no response. If you watch that, that, the, the, the video where Larry Kramer asserts very, very matter-of-factly that we are in the middle of a fucking play, he said. At the very end, he says what? He says, I'm going to say what I said in year one, when it was 41 cases, then in year 10. He began with the number that 40 million people was infected. The question becomes, how do we go from 41 to 40 million people in 10 years? 10 years. These two, I'm leaving out, coming back for a particular reason. There's a wonderful, this, the, 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 some of the clips that I took from is from a, 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 a documentary called How to Survive a Plague. And at the very end of the documentary, the act of organizers began to sit around and they began to talk and they said, we thought our lot in life was to watch each other die. Everyone was getting infected. We were dying. Treatment wasn't really effective. In fact, it was killing folk. And then they said, we began to live. 
the we because Merck Pharmaceutical in 1996 created the combination therapy. The men now were taking it and becoming undetectable. They said, we begin to live. You, asked, you put in the conversation at the height of the AIDS epidemic. I asked the question, who are the we are they talking about? Let me jump forward. 2001, there was an HIV prevalence study called Young Men Who Are Sex of Men. Prevalence just means how many people have it. Right? Think about COVID, how, much, how many cases are there? How many people have it? And what came out of that study was that 33% black men who are sex with men between the ages of 23 and 29 was HIV positive. One out of every three. It was huge. One out of every three. 2002, they did a YMSM2 study. This was an incident study to look at how fast the infection was growing. And one of the things that researchers look at to level off an infection at an incident rate needs to be about 1.5 to 2% in this community, in the community. And what came out of this, and please don't worry about my horrible handwriting. I know you can read it. <laughs> this is just for me. 2003, what came out of that was that white men who had sex with men, that same age range, 23 to 29, the incident rate was 1.5 to 2%. That was very good. This is a direct correlation between Merck Pharmaceutical, the, the, the combination therapy, and folks having access to take it, 1.5 to 2%. With Latino men in that same age range, the incident rate was about 3.5 to 5%. That means it's, as, it's growing as fast as it needs to be in order to level it off. In Sub-Saharan Africa, where there were about 24 million people who were HIV positive, the incident rate was 6%, three times as fast than white men or six in men. With African-American men in that same age range, the incident rate was 13%. Who are we, we talking about? Twice as fast as Sub-Saharan Africa. 2003, there were some trans women in Baltimore who, con who contracted TB. And the Baltimore Health Department put out communication. There was a rise of TB in trans community. They had no idea that the trans women were part of the house ball community and that these folks were transient and these trans women had engaged in sexual contact with these, these, these cisgender gay men. They moved from Philadelphia, moved to New York City. New York City being a little more nuanced in their communication put out the rise of TB in the house ball ballroom community. The Center for Disease Control, which is in Atlanta in, in the U.S., asked, what is a house ball community? And if there are large numbers of black and Latino gay men and trans folk, there has to be some HIV. Let's do a study. So they did a study of house ball members in New York City. It was a prevalent study. What came out of that study was 18% of house ball members in New York City were HIV positive. 2005, they did another prevalence study. This was called a five-city study. Looked at New York City, Baltimore, Miami, Los Angeles, and Oakland. No, Los Angeles and San Francisco. No longer was it 33%. It was down 46% black gay men were HIV positive. 46. New York City Health Commissioner put out communication. There was a rise of new HIV infection rates with young black and Latino MSMs. We were not surprised. The surprise was the age. Usually when we think of YMSMs, we're thinking between the ages of 16 to 24. This looked at 13-year-olds to 21. I'm going to go back to 2007. 2011, CDC put out for the very first time in the history of the epidemic, new HIV infection rates were on a decline across all demographics. 
except for with black gay men, it was a 48% increase. Two thousand sixteen, the CDC put out communication that one out of every two black gay men will be HIV positive by the age of forty. One out of every two. Who are the we we are talking about? One out of every two by the age of forty. CDC estimates that black gay men in the American context has the highest HIV rates, not in the Northeast of America. Not in the Southwest, not in the Midwest, not even in the West Coast, not even in the U.S., but in the whole world outside of Botswana, South Africa. In the whole world. So the fundamental question is, how does a marginalized black gay male community and a marginalized black community in America rivals the whole, have more than the whole world and rival sub-Saharan Africa, Botswana? Go back to 2007, and I'm going to bring Kelly Brown Douglas, her assertion around the church. One of the things we begin to witness in the house ball community is a trend in death. I talked about this yesterday in Professor Daniel's class. December 2006, young black gay man, HIV positive, uh, dealing with crystal meth, winds up dead in his apartment. A month later, January 2007, icon in the house wall Warren community wants a dead HIV positive. Two weeks later, a young black gay man, organizer, organizer around house ball stuff, wants a dead HIV positive. February, two months later, April 2007, Javante, who's the very best friend of Lorenzo, who died on December 6th, he winds up dying HIV positive. May, the very next month, my own son, Ray, winds up dead, he's very positive. In June, another young black gay man, a Leon in the house ball community, winds up dead, HIV positive. August, iconic trans woman, winds up dead, HIV positive, in the house ball community. December, an iconic trans woman in the house walking community winds up in a hospital with 40 T cells, 30 day coma, and nine infections. She survives, still alive. 2008, the numbers increased. 2009, the numbers even increased more so. And we were wondering what is going on? How is it that having greater access to treatment, having greater access to prevention, that these numbers continue to increase. It's part of the reason why I made a decision to go to seminary, because it is absolutely my assertion that if we were in dealing with this theology of abomination, that it would not work. I wouldn't care what kind of skill you gave a person. If they believe that who they are is not valuable enough, the idea of HIV testing in, is as an initiative, as a uh, as a methodology in the beginning, in the early 90s, was that if you tested people and you test them early enough they became, and they found they were HIV positive, you connected them to care. But you have to care about this to sustain care. So one of the things we began to do was begin to organize. Professor Travis talked about Marlon Bellis' notion of the intravention. I'm not showing the video. And these, from 2007, the house ball community have been creating both regional and national interventions. Has everything to do with one that we begin to see this trend of house members dying. 
had everything to do with what I did not talk about in 1986 as black gay men began creating our own agencies because we thought that black people were not addressing HIV and that white gay men were not addressing the issues around race and sexuality. Black gay men began creating our own organization in 1986, but made a political and intentional decision to ostracize the houseball community out of it. And it was my assertion or some analysis or assessment that 20 years later, December 2006, we began to see latent effect of being ostracized out of the movement. So we begin to create our own. We don't have to go through this a lot. But these are some of the things that we've been able to do. When it, time is, it's a good time. I want to end with this little video. This notion of why art's important. It's a young black gay man in a house ball community, black Latino gay man who moved, who was born in New York. Mother moved to Florida, got a new man. Her man didn't like the fact that he was gay. She she, put, she moved him back to New York City. He lived with his uncle. And his uncle's wife found him in his room with his boyfriend. And the uncle came to his nephew and said, listen, my, my wife, she doesn't like this kind of behavior in her home. You're going to have to move. And he said, well, give me to the end of the week. And the uncle went and told the rest of the family that he was gay. But he added a layer and said he was HIV positive, which was not true. The young man moved out, wind up living on the streets of New York City and on the train station, winds up going on one of the apps, and meets an older black man. The older black man says, let me take you to dinner and to a movie. So they go to dinner. Too late for the movie. And he says, come back to my hotel room. And he calls two other men to rape and beat and brutalize him. And what this young black gay man did was take his poetry to not, to not only be cathartic, but to begin to elicit the other voices of his compadres around this same issue. So I will end with showing that the wonderful, beautiful poem, and then open it up. You have to understand the struggle to be a part of the fight. You see, some of us fight for a cause unseen because others choose to go blind until it affects them, but my fight isn't going in. You see, this clock of mine reads exactly this. It was two years, two months, seven days, and 21 hours ago that I decided to own up to who I am. And it was two years, six days, and 15 hours ago that I was first judged. Exiled from my preference and emotionally slain, discouraged from following the path that I had previously lain, and it was one year and two months ago that my life on the streets began. Never knowing the hustle. Never knowing the dangers on the streets, and I had to grow up fast, believing life will get better. So simply put, I thought to myself, man, forget the past. But you see, this clock of mine, it must be broken because it was one year and one month ago today that I was raped. Some people believe it's hard for men to get raped, but ask me how easy it was to break free from three angry men punching, kicking, screaming, pleading for God's help. I lay beaten, beaten as the result of my mother's inability to protect her young because a man came first. No, you see, this clock of mine, it must be broken because it was one year and seven days ago that I discovered a high. And as I allowed every drug to run its course through my veins, numbing the pain as I was sold for profit so that I didn't go hungry, you see, that was modern day slavery. Street corners marked with my blood and bed sheets stained with a grown man's will to be pleased. And it was one year ago that I caught my first charge. 
not only making me a statistic five times over, but breaking my spirit as I gazed at the people on the other side of the bars, and that was the zoo. And I was the young man caged for the rage that finally erupted. You see this clock of mine, it must be broken, because all the while I've been calling my mother, begging for money to eat and a way home. Please, I cried, I screamed, self-mutilated, and deemed myself unworthy. Alone is a feeling I'm much too acquainted with. Discomfort is a feeling I'm much too acquainted with. Anger is a feeling I'm much too acquainted with. But at the time, see, where was my joy? And it was 11 months ago that I made my way out. Nine months ago that I found myself on Florida A&M's campus. And eight months later, which is today that I speak the words that need to be heard. Judge carefully. Welcome willfully. Listen to the cries of those around you, cause remembering the pain of not being heard can disintegrate the soul, and every day I remember. See, this clock of mine, it isn't broken. It's just that the arms of my mother refuse to move. Refuse to get into a position in which time reads that she is ready for me to fit into her life again. The embrace I've been waiting for. Nevertheless, she refuses to comprehend these words that I've spoken. Love unconditionally. Although you may not be loved in return, for this, this is the lesson that even I had to learn. Let me clap for that. That is who, his name is Gio, is my kinship son in the House Ball Baldwin community. And he uses now, not only does he a vulgar, but he uses his poetry to contextualize. So, so I, let's, let's open this up. I know that was a lot. And so, oh. Can I speak to you? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, yes, please. <laughs> <applause for me. laughs> we're, we'll have time for questions, but I just want to make two really quick housekeeping remarks. One is that if you want snacks, food, or coffee or tea, feel free to grab them during the Q&A because yes. it's going to go away right at 6. And we also have to leave the room at six, but I imagine there will be some conversations and folks will have other questions for Michael, if you're willing. So we might have them just outside the room. Um, don't, don't be offended if I start ushering us out at six. <laughs> so uh, with that, yeah, Q and A. So we have nine minutes. <laughs> Any comments, questions, concerns, things you did not get? Yeah. I uh, thank you, first of all. Um, my name is Aaron. Uh, yeah. um, I grew up in the Baptist church in Canada, and my grandpa was a reverend, and I almost want to call you reverend because when you grow up in the church, especially the Baptist church, it has this charismatic movement where the spirit is very much a part of the emotions of the, the, the whole part. And what I notice about the way you speak is there's this fusion of ministry in how you speak and how one of the things I appreciate about the sermon notion is that it moves people from point A to point B and that's its power and I saw it repeated in some of the videos in particular of the lip sync video because she moved that audience from silence to motion but she barely moved and that was I think it's some of the power of how you're doing what you're doing and how I see this the way that the church has given black folks the tools to move people through this kind of sermon-like exchange. And I just wanted to say, I, I, that was one of the things I saw, heard, and felt. <laughs> um, and I appreciated it. So thank you. Well, first of all, you got a remarkable voice. I hope someone has told you that before. Your voice is remarkable. So. I was the one singing in the church. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like the very white version of, of the, yeah. So that's number one. I will, uh, so thank you for that. I, my, um, my response to what you said, I think you're absolutely right. I oftentimes say the reverse, that black folk gave the church the voice. Right. Because one of the things we make the mistake is that somehow we believe that the, the very, um, who, there's an ontology of blackness, this diaspora that has nothing to do with the church 
but it infused the church. And sometimes we make the mistake in giving credit to the church. And it is, I love what you said, because it is my distinction between theology and religion. That I think that religion is theological, but everything theological is not religion. That's why the blues is theological. That's why poetry is theological. That's why you can go to a gay club and have a, a, a DJ sitting on a pew. That's a minister, right? And the house music is the, the preaching word. And when we dance, it's worship. That's God. Be real clear. Erotic and divine at the same time. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Thank you so much for that uh, brilliant uh, lecture. I mean, it was just brilliant. Um, I was just really curious about, I know your focus is on um, Black and Latinx um, men, but I was just wanting to hear your thoughts about the role of uh, cisgendered women in in the sort of the ballroom culture, but also in terms of the kind of erasures in terms of uh, women and AIDS. So my focus isn't on Black Latin men. It was just this one. Yeah. But 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 ballroom is predominant in a U.S. context. Ballroom is predominantly. If I was doing a history of ballroom, this would be kind of a different conversation because I would talk about, um, particularly in the mid '90s, where you begin to see explosion. I've been in a house ball community now for 28 years, and when I first entered the scene, there was only four cities: New York, D.C., Baltimore, and Philadelphia. And then you begin to see an explosion. And so in the U.S. context, it's predominantly black and Latinx. But ballroom is in Paris, France, which is predominantly black uh, um, uh, migrant folk. It's in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's in Russia. It's in Sweden. It's in Mexico City. It's in all of these other places. But to your wonderful point, initially, so women, cis women, are, have historically always been part of the houseball community um, since the 70s. And a lot of the cis women at first, in fact, there's more relationship historically with cis women who identify as heterosexual first than lesbian women perform. And that has everything to do with gay, black, particularly black gay men's relationship to cis women. Um, and so, so in that sense, absolutely, yes. Um, the, the other thing is that one of the things I think that we make this misnomer and mistake is not when you think about a U.S. context, right, in the landscape of the U.S., the, the disease burden goes black gay men, Latino gay men, or black men, sex men, Latino sex men, and black women. And we have very little conversation around that dialogue. And in fact, the kind of conversation we have is usually a misnomer that black women are increasingly becoming infected because their men are DL. As opposed to black women are increasingly becoming infected because black women as black girls are told to be powerless around sex negotiations regardless who you're sleeping with. Uh, the last thing I say about this is kind of last thing, is that, so I got a lot of stuff from How to Survive a Plague documentary. It's one of my, one of my favorites. But a better documentary, even though it's one of my favorites, a better documentary is United in Anger because it's by lesbians who critique the patriarchy and act out. It's a great documentary. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Is that, was that you who said fuck you to book Bush? That was me. I was really <laughs> upset and I didn't have a tomato and like this is SFU's screen. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh girl, I was like, this, did she say that? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, shameless self-plug, but if you want to know more about uh, research surrounding cis and trans women living yes. with HIV, please check out Shauna at cdc.ca. Um, that is a yeah. longitudinal study focusing on cis and trans women living with HIV accessing care in Metro Vancouver. Um, setting that aside, I think you said you'd come back to 1986 and 1989? I did. I, okay. did, I did say it, but I did, I did it real quick. You didn't hear it. That was my fault. The 1986 was about, so as gay men, was black gay men particularly, critiquing black folk on, on addressing crack, right, and critiquing white gay men on not doing the intersection around race and, and sexuality, black gay men began organizing. So there was um, some community-based organizations created all in 1986. Gay men of African descent was the very first one. Um, 
There was an organization called uh, NMAC, National Minority AIDS Council. A DOTI was a, a spiritual organization that was all created. And as though it was critiquing both black community and white gay men, it did the same thing. It made a political and intentional decision to ostracize the house wall community out of AIDS organizing. This, this classist notion that this community was not worth, let me back at that real quick. There's, a, there's a, a, a black lesbian from the University of Chicago named Kathy Cohen. She wrote a wonderful text called um, The Boundaries of Blackness. It's her, it's her analysis around the AIDS epidemic, a political critique, and she asserts this. And one of the, she uses the word boundaries of blackness, she says, because that means who was worthy enough to be saved. That black people made an intentional decision to say that, that black gay men could get infected and then black women could get infected and was not worthy to be, the conversation wasn't worthy to be had until Magic Johnson became infected. So the patriarchy. Um, and so that's what it was. That was it. I also just wanted to say thank you for like this whole talk and um, for pointing out. My um my mistake. No, that was not a no, mistake. No, no, no. no, it wasn't no you I, should say it. You but should it wasn't. say it. People are so uncomfortable no, with no, being no, no, called no, out. No, beloved, it wasn't. But he's my, my my theological beloved, right? No, beloved, it was not a mistake. What I love why you said it is because it's not a mistake. It is the belief that everyone has. So there's two things. Unless you work in a silo of public health, particularly in the U.S., and particularly if you're dealing with black and Latin gay men, you believe that the epidemic is over, when in fact the numbers are astronomical. And so the question then becomes that, that, that our numbers are so astronomical that it's not worthy to be talked about, which then suggests that my life is not worthy. So I love the fact that you put it in the world like that. I love the fact that you were bringing up, like, who is the we? Because, like, I've been thinking about this this entire talk because I was just thinking about the amount of times we heard the word unprecedented yeah. when it came to the COVID pandemic and the number of indigenous folks and That's gay right. folks, trans folks That's being right. like, is it though? For whom? Yeah. Right? Who's the we? Who's the public? Who counts here? Well, and, like, who's, who's not being listened to? Well, real quick... And black gay men can be pushed on our shit because, excuse my language, because that even 40, 41 years, 41 years in the epidemic, there's very little epidata on trans folk. 41 years later, right? So thank you. That be it? <laughs> Every time I hear you speak, I leave with a long list of films and to, to watch and books to read. Oh. And um, for those of you who want to hear more from Michael, we're so fortunate because he's going to be back right here tomorrow evening. But this is about Vogue. It's history of Vogue With, and all that stuff. We've got Vogue in here and all this other stuff. So yeah. Van Vogue Jam is going to be doing yes. a workshop. So please come back and join me one more time in thanking Michael for traveling all this way and sharing with us his wisdom. Oh, and I forgot and to thank you. Yeah. I forgot to thank, if not for PT here, <laughs> if not for <laughs> PhD here, I would not be here. If not for Am, I would not be here. So I give a lot of gratitude to the three. We have a lot of love for you, yeah. Michael. So come back again.